Good morning. I'm joined today by FBI Director Chris Ray, the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia, Zach Terwilliger, and the Acting Assistant Director in charge of the Washington Field Office, James Dawson. We are here to announce the indictment of Alexander Cote and Al Shafi Al Sheikh. Cote and Al Sheikh were members of the notoriously brutal ISIS hostage taking cell that became known as the Beatles, a name their captives gave to them because of their British accents. The defendants are charged with terrorism offenses related to hostage taking and killing of four Americans, as well as citizens of Great Britain and Japan. For over a year, Cote and Al Sheikh were held in Iraq by the US military under the law of armed conflict. I'm pleased to confirm that they are now in FBI custody and will soon appear in federal court in the Eastern District of Virginia. Today is a good day, but it is also a solemn one. Today, we remember the four innocent Americans whose lives were taken by ISIS. James Wright Foley, Stephen Joel Sotloff, Peter Edward Kasig, and Kayla Jean Mueller. Many around the world are familiar with the barbaric circumstances of their deaths. But we will not remember these Americans for the way they died. We will remember them for the way they lived their good and decent lives. James Foley was a print and video journalist who was covering the civil war in Syria. He had previously served as a conflict zone correspondent in Iraq and then in Libya. James was a former elementary school teacher. Stephen Sotloff was a journalist who covered the Middle East and was in Syria reporting on the refugee crisis. According to a longtime friend, he was drawn to the region to, quote, give a voice to the people who didn't have one, close quote. Stephen was the grandson of Holocaust survivors who inspired him to be that voice. Peter Kassig was in Syria working for a humanitarian organization that he founded to deliver food and medical aid to the refugees. He had previously served as an elite airborne ranger in the US Army, which included service in Iraq. Kayla Mueller was a humanitarian aid worker and human rights activist who, inspired by her faith, devoted much of her young life to serving those in need both at home and abroad. As President Trump shared during his 2020 State of the Union address, the American warriors who conducted the military operation that resulted in the death of ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi were in so inspired by Kayla that they named the mission Task Force 814, a reference to August 14th, Kayla's birthday. Today's announcement is the result of many years of hard work in the pursuit of justice for these Americans. We have been inspired by their memories and moved by the determination and grit of their families. Families which will never rest until justice is done. To them, I say this, neither will we. Although we cannot bring back your children, we will do all that we can, obtain justice for them, for you, and for all Americans. As for Cote and Al Sheikh, like many other terrorists before them, they have underestimated the American resolve to obtain justice <laughs> for our fellow citizens who are harmed or killed by terrorists anywhere in the world. These men will now be brought before a United States court to face justice for the depraved acts alleged against them in the indictment. As for their ringleader, Mohammed M. Wazi, infamously known as Jihadi John, he faced a different kind of American resolve, the mighty reach of our military, which successfully targeted him in an airstrike several years ago. My message to other terrorists is this. If you harm an American, you will face the same fate as these men. You will face American arms in the battlefield. And if you survive that, you will face American justice in an American courtroom and the prospect of many years in an American prison. Either way, you will never live in peace. You will be pursued to the ends of the earth. No matter how long it takes, 
We will never forget. We will never quit. To the American people, today's announcement is a reminder of the threat that we continue to face from radical Islamic terrorism. These terrorists despise the freedoms and the way of life we cherish and are hell-bent on imposing their ideologies on a world that continues to reject them. Although our nation faces a variety of national security threats from many quarters, we will not relent in our efforts to protect America and her citizens from the threat posed by terrorists. Today's announcement would not have been possible without the relentless effort of countless dedicated prosecutors, agents, and analysts who are the bedrock of the Department of Justice. I want to thank the prosecutors from the U.S. Attorney's Office of the Eastern District of Virginia, from my own National Security Division, and all of the many FBI agents and analysts who have worked tirelessly on this case. I also want to thank the Office of International Affairs and the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, both of which assisted with important aspects of this investigation. The Attorney General wanted me to convey that the support of the United Kingdom's Home Secretaries Sajid Javid and Priti Patel was critical to moving this investigation and prosecution forward, and he extends his sincerest gratitude for their unwavering commitment to the pursuit of justice in this case. We also want to thank all of our international partners who have come forward thus far with evidence, and I would encourage any others with evidence to come forward as well. We understand that the justice we seek in this case will extend to many people in numerous other countries around the world, and we humbly and enthusiastically accept that responsibility. We all have our part to do our part in confronting and defeating ISIS. Just last week, the department announced our significant successes in repatriating and prosecuting a number of US citizens who went to Syria to join and support ISIS and were detained by the Syrian defend the democratic forces. The United States has been a leader in taking responsibility for its citizens who left to join ISIS. And as the case we are announcing today highlights, when we have the evidence to do so, we will also take responsibility for prosecuting those non-US citizens who have injured or killed Americans anywhere in the world. If you have American blood in your veins or you have American blood on your hands, you will face American justice. This department has successfully prosecuted hundreds of defendants since 9-11 for terrorism-related offenses in our federal courts, and we will continue to do so. Finally, I want to acknowledge the Departments of State and the Department of Defense. We will continue to work together with them and our other partners in the U.S. government to combat the scourge of terrorism. The step we take today is just that, a step. But it is a big step. And I can assure you that the women and men of the Department of Justice will not stop until justice is won. Thank you, Director Ray. Good morning. Today's announcement makes clear once again that combating terrorism remains the FBI's top priority and that the entire United States government remains committed to bringing to justice anyone who harms our citizens. We showed that resolve to the world last week by repatriating Americans who had traveled to Syria to support ISIS so that they will face charges here. And today we're demonstrating that resolve by bringing to our shores two men who left Britain to become ISIS terrorists. Now they're going to face justice in an American court of law for crimes against American citizens. Not long after these terrorists were captured in 2018, the parents of their American victims wrote the following about their loved ones, and I quote, one by one, our children were taken from us by the hateful criminals of the Islamic State. Jim, Stephen, Peter, and Kayla were like so many of your own sons and daughters. They were four unique, passionate young Americans, and all risked their lives pursuing a greater good. The families of those victims have suffered the painful loss of their loved ones at the hands of brutal killers. And while their pain may never fully subside, today, with the announcement of this indictment, we're beginning to bring them the justice 
they deserve. But we owe these families more than justice. We owe them our gratitude. And I say that because their advocacy for their loved ones has led to positive changes in how our government supports and partners with victims' families. One of those changes was the creation a few years ago of the Hostage Recovery Fusion Cell. This multi-agency team, based at FBI headquarters, represents our government's unified approach to recovering American hostages abroad. Its single focus is to bring these hostages home safely and partner with their families in the recovery effort. A key part of that fusion cell is the family engagement team. That team not only coordinates support to family members of hostages during times of agony and uncertainty, it also supports hostages and families once the crisis is over. The FBI and our partners are working tirelessly every day to recover all U.S. hostages held abroad, and we won't rest until we see a similar resolution for justice against all those responsible for holding Americans captive, especially when those captives' lives are taken. Today, I want to also thank the men and women of the FBI and our domestic and international partners for their unflagging efforts to investigate, charge, and ultimately hold these two men responsible for their crimes. Over the course of this investigation and many others like it, these dedicated professionals put themselves at risk, conducting interviews and collecting evidence to build the cases that ultimately led us to where we are today, with these two men facing justice in the United States. Like Assistant Attorney General Demers, uh, and based on conversations I've had on a number of occasions, including on the phone just this morning with the Attorney General, I know the Attorney General joins us in particularly thanking our British counterparts and our international partners in working with the United States to bring charges in our criminal justice system. We mourn not only our American victims, but also the British victims, David Haynes and Alan Henning, and victims of all nations who suffered unimaginable cruelty at the hands of ISIS. Let there be no doubt, the FBI, the U.S. government, and our partners remain vigilant in the fight against terrorism, including the threat from ISIS. Today, ISIS is still trying to radicalize people here in the United States and elsewhere through online propaganda and their global network of supporters. Their goal is to motivate people to launch attacks against Western targets wherever they are using any means available. But as today's announcement shows, the FBI and our partners, both here and overseas, will continue to relentlessly pursue these terrorists and anyone who chooses to support terrorist organizations like ISIS, no matter where they are and no matter how long it takes. Now I'll turn things over to Zach Terwilliger, the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia, to provide a little bit more details about the indictment itself. Thank you, Director Wright. First, I want to thank Attorney General Barr for his steadfast leadership and support of this investigation and prosecution. Let me be very clear. This day, this day does not happen without Attorney General Barr and his resolve and commitment to seeing that these individuals were brought to justice. As Director Ray mentioned, my name is Zach Terwilliger. I'm the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia, located just across the Potomac River in Alexandria. It's with a heavy heart that we're here today, and I wish we weren't. But if these alleged atrocities indeed happened, I'm proud to be here as a representative of the United States and our criminal justice system. As many of you are now aware, yesterday an eight-count criminal indictment was returned in the Eastern District of Virginia that charged two alleged terrorists, Alexander Cote and El Shafi Al Sheikh, with the following felony offenses. Conspiracy to commit hostage taking resulting in death. Hostage taking resulting in death. One count for each of the American hostages. James Wright Foley, Kayla Jean. Mueller, Stephen, Joel, Sotlov, and Peter, Edward, Kasich. Count six, conspiracy to murder United States citizens outside of the United States. Count seven, conspiracy to provide material support to terrorists 
in the form of hostage taking resulting in death and murder. Count eight, conspiracy to provide material support to a terrorist organization. If convicted, the defendants face a maximum penalty of life in prison for each count of conviction. Pursuant to well-known protections provided by our constitutional republic in its system of criminal justice, Cote and El Sheikh are presumed innocent unless and until proven otherwise. All that I'm about to recount now are allegations and can be found in the four corners of the 24-page indictment, which was unsealed just a moment ago. As stated in that charging document, these alleged terrorists both grew up in the United Kingdom where they became radicalized. Their role within the ISIS terrorist organization was that of being part of a brutal hostage-taking scheme by which American, European, and Asian citizens were taken hostage from approximately 2012 to 2015. Their alleged criminal acts include conspiring to commit hostage-taking resulting in death and conspiring to murder American citizens James Foley, Kayla Mueller, Stephen Sotloff, and Peter Cassidy. As part of the conspiracy, their vicious acts and those of co-conspirators Mohammed M. Wazi and CC1 are alleged to include the following. Forced witnessing of murders, mock executions, shocks via electric taser, beatings, amongst other brutal acts. Also a well-established principle in American jurisprudence American jurisprudence, co-conspirators like these, these, these defendants may be held liable for the foreseeable acts of their co-conspirators, such as Mwazi that took place during the course of the conspiracy. As stated in detail, Cote, El Sheikh, Mwazi, and CC1 facilitated hostage taking, ransom demands, abuse, and the murder of Americans Europeans, and Asian citizens in order to further their terrorist agenda and that of ISIS. The brutal acts of beheading were captured by the ISIS media propaganda machine and disseminated to, to achieve their aims of jihad. Further, as detailed in the indictment, part of the alleged horrific conditions of confinement, the self-proclaimed leader of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, also made it a point to repeatedly sexually assault American citizen Kayla Jean Mueller. As you know, al-Baghdadi was killed on or about October 26, 2019, in a United States military operation named in honor of Kayla and her birthday, August 14th, Operation 814. For these acts, these two alleged terrorists will now face the American justice system. Later today, we expect these defendants to make their initial appearance a few miles away in Alexandria, Virginia. At that hearing, they will be informed of the charges against them. They will be provided with counsel if they cannot afford it. They will receive medical care and be housed in a sanitary facility and be provided with three meals a day, all coupled with the due process of law. All things denied to James, Kayla, Stephen, and Peter and the other British and Japanese victims named in the indictment. Like Director Ray, in preparation for today, I reviewed, some, I reviewed some prose that really captured what today is all about. And I quote, they should be brought to America to face our justice system. And that is what our children would have wanted. Give them the fair trial that makes our nation great. That would be the best way to honor our children. Ensuring that truth and justice find their way out of this tragic story would mean that the Islamic State will never have the last word. Well, Diane and John, Paula and Ed, Marsha and Carl, and Shirley and Art. It's now a certainty. ISIS will not have the last word when it comes to your children. You will. Attorney General Demers. I hand that over to lines of questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star and then one on your text phone. If you 
you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note that you will be limited to one question and we do ask that you specify who your question is for. We will now pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question today comes from Ryan Lucas with NPR. Hi, uh, thank you for doing this. Um, first question is, how important was the British evidence that uh, the Justice Department has been you know, fighting for five years to try to get from the UK government? And would we be here today without it? And then what does this case say uh, about the ability of the Justice Department um, to bring all terrorist cases uh, to US civilian courts for trial? So thanks, Ryan. I think we decided that if we were going to do this case, we were going to tell the fullest story we could of what these defendants did, and we were going to put on the strongest case possible. And with the British evidence, I think we can do that very well. As for your second question, as you know, the department has prosecuted hundreds of terrorists in federal court since 9-11. We have done so successfully. We've protected classified information when we've needed to, and we've gotten justice for many victims and, and many convictions. You can expect us to continue to do so. And our next question comes from Pete Williams with NBC. Thank you, Mr. Demers. Can you tell us uh, Specifically, what does the indictment allege that Cote and Al Sheikh did regard, with regard to the four Americans? Sure, thanks, Pete. I think I'll turn that over to, to Zach on the indictment. Thank you, John. Thank you, Pete. Yes, um, I want to be very careful and stay to the four corners of the indictment. Pete, as you re review that 24 page document, you will see that we have alleged a conspiracy uh, regarding hostage taking resulting in death. Um, there are many allegations in that document. It's a speaking indictment. And I think what you will see is that um, their roles uh, absolutely engage in the facilitation, uh, the ransom demands, and, and the abuse of hostages as alleged in that indictment. And as, as I stated, as you know, um, but our viewers may not, um, if you have multiple individuals in a conspiracy, you are liable for the foreseeable acts of your co-conspirator. So at that point, uh, Pete, I think I will leave it at that. I'm always happy to talk uh, later on about more specifics. And our next question comes from Daniel Bates with Daily Mail. Hi, this is Robin Stavis. Um, I just wanted to uh, seek reassurance that um, uh, prosecutors will not be um, seeking the death penalty in this case. Obviously, that was one of the conditions um, of um, sort of British intelligence providing assistance. But can you guarantee us that there won't be a U-turn and you won't be seeking the death penalty with this case? Thank you. Well, I think the Attorney General made that very clear in his letters to the Home Secretary that <clears throat> He decided, you know, on balance that we were not going to be uh, pursuing the death penalty in this case, and, and that's where we are. Our next question comes from Eric Tucker with the Associated Press. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, uh, John um, and Zach, I guess the question might be best directed at you. Can you talk a little bit about the interaction with the family members over the last year in terms of um, how important their wishes were in terms of bringing um, these two individuals to justice and the nature of the conversations you had with them? Sure. I mean, look, I think everyone on this stage has met with the families. I know the director and I did together um, some time ago. You know, we listen uh, very carefully to the voices of the family. We weigh their views uh, very seriously. Ultimately, we have to make our own judgment about whether we can bring a case of this nature, but the family's views uh, were critical to our thinking on this case. And, you know, as the director said, and as Zach said, uh, we are very grateful for their uh, continued advocacy for their children. Uh, and for the continued attention that they've brought to this case, for their advocacy not just you know, in this country, but also in the UK and in other countries in uh, helping make this the strongest case we can. 
just briefly, thanks for the question, Eric. Yes. And our last question comes from Jake Gibson with Fox News. Uh, thanks for doing the call. Thanks for taking my question. Number one, I just kind of have a two-parter. Number one, is it simply because we, in other cases like this, you may uh, uh, seek the death penalty. Is that not happening in this case simply because that was a, a UK demand for their uh, cooperation, number one? And number two, um, was there any thought from European nations or the UK that they would like to try this case on their own because they also have victims. I mean, ultimately, why did it end up here? Thank you. So thanks for the question. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, you know, the decision at first of the department was to leave open the possibility to seek the death penalty. There's a whole process for doing that, and obviously that's a process that we never undertook because uh, the attorney general decided uh, that uh, we should provide the death penalty assurance in order to get the British evidence and see that justice could be done uh, more expeditiously than if we had to, uh, you know, continue to litigate this issue in the courts in the United Kingdom. Uh, so, uh, you know, we never got there in terms of determining whether we would seek the death penalty or not. Uh, the decision was to, to try to keep the option open at first, but ultimately um, that didn't work. As for why other uh, countries uh, are not doing this case and we're doing it, maybe you know that's a, a better question for them. But as I said in, in my uh, remarks here, when we have American victims, we are very willing uh, to do these cases. Just to add one thing on that. As far as the, um, the other countries, one of the things that the FBI works very hard at uh, and in this case, our Washington field office uh, had the extraterritorial responsibility is to work very closely with our counterparts from all these other nations, both in terms of developing evidence for our own cases, but in some cases providing assistance to them uh, as they build their own. Uh, and we work very closely with each other, and uh, that's an important part of the international cooperation that exists on these kinds of cases, because we're all facing uh, attacks against our citizens from ISIS, uh, and we hope that uh, many of those nations will be able to bring cases uh, in a, cases against their citizens as we go forward. Thanks. Just to Zach Terwilliger again, just to respond to Eric Tucker's question regarding the victims, one thing I want to make clear, um, we utilize in the Eastern District of Virginia, as do in the vast majority of U.S. Attorney's offices, a victim-centric approach. Um, the victims and their families uh, in this case uh, are what's driving our pursuit of justice. That, that's who we represent, the people of the United States. So I look forward to um, a close relationship with the families as this process moves forward. Uh, we actually have uh, rights set out for uh, victims' families under the Crime Victims' Rights Act. Um, and we have special personnel who, who will be liaisons between them and our office. And I look forward uh, to the opportunity to spend more and more time with them uh, as we move forward and seek justice on behalf of their children. The conference has now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.